It is now time for question period. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Good morning, Speaker. It looks like my question will be for the Acting Premier this morning. Uh, you hired uh, Don Drummond to map the way out of the financial mess that you got us into. Uh, he told us to balance the budget will require, quote, tough decisions and, quote, most of the burden must fall on spending. Now we understand your plan is to shift the focus from restraint and go on a spending spree. Any family speaker having trouble paying their bills knows that you don't run out and buy a swimming pool. Right. What you're proposing over on that side is absolutely preposterous. You're using your MasterCard to pay off your visa and your visa to pay off your MasterCard. How do you expect people to believe you can balance the budget by 2017 and 18? And uh, as the Premier has said on many occasions, we are implementing uh, Drummond's recommendations. In fact, we've implemented 60 per cent of them. What is absolutely preposterous, Speaker, is when they stand up and say, if, if, uh, implement Drummond, implement Drummond, implement Drummond, and then when we do implement Drummond, they oppose us every single step of the way, Speaker. So as Minister of Health, we've made changes to physio. You've objected to that every step of the way. We worked to bring down the price of drugs. You objected every step of the Fair way. Place. We had some tough negotiations with physicians. You objected every step of the way. You got to choose a lane. Hey. Hey. Well, thank you, Speaker. That's rich considering this government has added $20 billion to our debt this year alone. Just this year. When Moody's downgraded you, they also said that if you don't stabilize the debt burden, you will risk another credit downgrade. You say you're going to spend and grow your way to balance, but the Bank of Canada just two weeks ago told us that Ontario will not meet our growth projections for this year nor for next. You're not fooling anyone. But we're not the only ones who have seen through this fiscal uh, facade. Yesterday, the revered Wall Street Journal reported that Ontario's fiscal situation is worse than California's, wow. and the province will have trouble hitting its target of deficit. And that's before your new spending announcement of yesterday. So, Acting Premier, will you please tell us, is the Wall Street Journal wrong in their forecast? I think it's pretty clear that there's a real difference between the opposition party and ourselves. Because you know what, Speaker? Order, please. Order, please. Order, please. Minister. Speaker, they have chosen to focus everything on reaching that zero deficit speaker we have chosen growing the economy we have chosen jobs speaker we we believe that the way to strength the way to economic strength the way to balance is through growth through jobs through prosperity speaker we're still on track to balance but i tell Order. you our holy grail speaker is, a, is investing in our people investing in our infrastructure and having a dynamic thriving business community Listen, the only thing they care about is the deficit. We're not like that, Speaker. Answer. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Wall Street Journal isn't the only respected outlet who's not buying this line from you, uh, uh, Acting Premier. The Globe and Mail this week called your plan to encourage corporate investment, quote, equal parts lunacy, desperation, and a return to failed 1970s-style state planning. Globe and Mail. The Globe also said, quote, there is a very clear sense in which the Ontario government is playing, quote, blame the victim for the sorry state of the provincial economy. Not your own problem. These are hardly ringing endorsements. They're condemnations. Now is not the time to play riverboat gambler with Ontario's finances. We need real order. leadership to return to prosperity. Will Attorney you admit General that you're in order. over your head and you just are not up to this job? Here, here. <laughs> I did not get attention for you to start. Acting Premier. Thank you, Speaker. Our priority is clear. We're focused on creating great jobs, attracting great jobs, Speaker, and we're, we're focused on helping support middle-class families in protecting key services, Speaker. 
That's our priority. So what people like um, the members opposite don't understand that achieving that zero deficit is the member no from Renfrew victory come to order. if it means that people don't have jobs. The member from Leeds Grenville come to order. Good question. The member from Nepean Carlton. My question as well is to the Deputy Premier. Yesterday, the Liberals survived a progressive Conservative motion on the gas plants, thanks again to the NDP for sitting on their hands, abstaining, and choosing, of course, the Liberal Party over the people of Ontario. Yep. Together, the NDP and the Liberals have accomplished a great deal together. They doubled the debt in the past 10 years to $270 billion. They ran together a $12 billion deficit. They together voted in to ensure that the horse racing industry would be destroyed in Ontario. They are keeping one million Ontarians from being politically employed. And uh, sir, sir, there is one other thing that they have done together. They have found the OPP in order to have investigations into, OP into the uh, gas plant scandal and into the orange fiasco. So this marriage between the Liberals and the NDP has been utterly catastrophic for the people of Ontario. Question. Will the Deputy Premier pull her party out of a coalition with the Liberals and actually face the people and get a mandate Thank you. Uh, speaker, our premiers made it very clear that we are working very hard to find common, common ground. The voters of this province sent a minority government to Queen's Park, and we are working to make minority government work. Speaker, that means working with the opposition party sometimes. It means working with the NDP party sometimes. Speaker, but our job is to make this government work. And that means working with both opposition parties so we can continue to improve the lives of the people in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, this Liberal government only survives because of the help of the NDP, so that's why we have a high jobless rate, it's why we have a high deficit, it's why we have a high debt, it's why we have a disastrous energy policies, all aided and abetted by the NDP. But the scandal, the $1.1 billion scandal with the gas plants at Oakville, is exactly what the Ontario public is the most angry about. They can't understand why this Liberal government sat in its place for two years and said the cancellation was only $40 million when that party over there knew for over two years it would be over $700 million, close to a billion, which it finally rang into. They also can't understand why the Premier of the province handed over bargaining rights to TCE and also why they obstructed the Information and Privacy Commissioner and chose a more expensive location. But we know that we are all on the hook for a $1.1 billion tab. Will the Liberals finally start to listen to the people of Ontario and seek a mandate from Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Energy. Mr. Of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the member will know that, uh, uh, speaking of the Oakville gas plant, the Premier initiated the Auditor General. True. The Auditor General did her work. She came in. She provided a report. But Mr. Speaker, what is important is that we're moving forward. Uh, that's why we're taking action to ensure electricity bills remain affordable for ratepayers. Number one, the clean energy benefit. But most importantly, cancelling or re rescheduling the uh, Samsung agreement, we saved $3.7 billion over the life of the contract. Changing the domestic content rules in the feed-in tariff program, saving ratepayers more than $1.9 billion over the life of the contracts. Deferring the construction of two new nuclear reactors at Darlington Generating Station, avoiding an estimated $15 billion in new construction costs. These are decisions we made over the last seven or eight months. They're making a significant difference. We're pushing the cost curve down on Thank you. And this member should get Thank with you. the new agenda. Seated, please. Final supplementary. Speaker. Only a party that has a $12 billion deficit would say they're overachieving. Only a party that blew $1 billion would have the audacity to look at the taxpayers and say they were saving them money. This is a premier that is leading his party that has not been elected by the people. Order. And amid this $1.1 billion gas plant scandal, she has refused to call a judicial inquiry. She has refused to call a want of confidence motion, and her staff obstructed the information and Privacy Commissioner, an officer of this assembly, from doing her job. Oh. Stephanie Delmore of Ottawa Vanier wrote to the Premier. She says, and I quote, My eight-year-old son was agog at the idea a billion dollars was spent, but nothing was constructed, nothing was gained. Even he concluded that a billion dollars a lot of stuff for our communities. Stephanie says this, I'm asking you to become more of a grown-up, more of a citizen. 
than a politician and have the guts to face the consequences. My eight year Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, that member should have the guts to deal with her leader's uh, position on the gas tax. What is it? We have here a quote from Mayor Rob Burton. On October 1, 2011, on the day before the provincial election, in front of the still under consideration Mississauga power plant, PC leader Tim Hudak promises to stop the power plant if he wins the election. There we go. On after only days before warning that he's sure it may cost another $1 billion. So he knew the cost. Later the in cost. 2013, he insists it was irresponsible for then Premier McGuinty to have cancelled it without wow. knowing what it would cost, what even though it cost far less than Hudak says he thinks it would have cost when he himself so he promised to cancel it. This is a new height in hypocrisy even for him. Oh. That's an exact quote, Mr. The member, regardless of whether he's reading or not, the member cannot say that withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. Wow. New question. <laughs> member from BGC Short. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Ontarians want to see Ontario's books balanced in a responsible manner. The government signed a plan to open a new corporate tax loophole to help Ontario's largest corporations write off the HST on expenses like whining and dining of clients. Under pressure from the NDP, the government agreed this was a $1.1 billion expense that Ontarians couldn't afford in tough times. When will the government permanently close this loophole, or has it abandoned it altogether? Thank you. Um, Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, we are absolutely committed to be responsible when it comes to managing the province's finances. In fact, last year, Speaker, spending was down. Spending was down last year for the first time since 1996. On the health care file, Speaker, we've gone from annual increases of 6 to 7 percent per year to 2 percent per year, and the health sector understands that that's the way it's going to be for the foreseeable future. We are transforming how we're doing business so that we can actually be responsible fiscally and continue to improve services that people so heavily rely on, Speaker. So I, I think that uh, if the member opposite actually uh, paid attention to the books, he would understand that we're being extremely responsible. We're taking our, our responsibility seriously, but we're not going to cut services. We're not going to slash services, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, with the greatest of respect, I asked a sensible question. I got a whole bunch of stuff and nothing to do with my oh, question at all. So I'm going to try a different tack. Maybe you can answer this one. Last fall, the government indicated that they were prepared to put a hard cap on public sector CEO salaries that have climbed into the seven-figure range. When will the government take that action, or is this yet another plan the Liberals plan to abandon. Uh, uh, and no, Speaker. In fact, we are looking at the issue of a broader public sector executive compensation because I think all of us understand that we need to have a, a responsible approach to executive compensation in the broader public sector. But I think the member opposite realizes that that is not a panacea. That is not a, the big fix, Speaker. Uh, in fact, in the healthcare sector, the issue around hospital CEO compensation amounts to 0.03 per cent of the budget. So, Speaker, yes, it's something we're looking at, but we're realistic to know it's not going to fix everything. Thank you. Final supplementary. Again, no one says it's going to fix everything, but the Liberals promise things and don't deliver. I'll try a third tack. Families who have seen the government waste over a billion dollars scrapping uh, private power uh, deals. They blow millions on perks and excesses at Orange and eHealth. They break promises of restraint at the top and dump billions of dollars more into new corporate tax loopholes that aren't creating jobs. Why should anyone take the government seriously when it comes to balancing Ontario's books? 
Government. Well, Speaker, I, I, I think I would simply beg to differ with the member opposite because, in fact, we are making great progress when it comes to jobs. We have uh, done far better than recoup the losses that we had during the Great Recession, Speaker, and we're continuing to improve outcomes for the people in this province, whether it's health outcomes or whether it's educational outcomes. Speaker, we're creating jobs. We're very focused on creating jobs. Our youth employment strategy has already demonstrated that with concerted effort in partnership with uh, the broader, broader society, we can put young people to work, Speaker. We can put people to work because they're, they're skilled, they're talented. We need to work together to get this economy really moving to benefit all of us. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. For more than 10 years, Liberals have been cutting no-strings-attached blank checks to businesses that aren't creating jobs. Does the Acting Premier still think no-strings-attached giveaways are the way to create jobs? Deputy Premier. Uh, Speaker, um, we have been in a position to support business in this province because that is where jobs are created, Speaker. So we are prepared to work with business community so they can create more jobs for the people of this province. Uh, Speaker, I think we have seen some excellent success when it comes to our investment in GM, for example. There are other very good examples of success. And, uh, uh, I think the member actually knows that because she lives in a community that has benefited from those investments. Supplementary. Uh, to, the, to the Acting Premier, actually, the region of Kitchener-Waterloo is successful in spite of this government. In 2011, Navistar and Chatham shut its doors, and 1,000 people lost their jobs. Order. Order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2011, Navistar and Chatham shut its doors, and 1,000 people lost their jobs. This government cut Navistar a $30 million check, but apparently didn't get a guarantee to keep jobs in Ontario. Navistar moved those jobs to a state with a job creator tax credit, something proposed by New Democrats. Later this month, there is going to be an auction at the Navistar plant. Will Ontarians get any of that $30 million back? Uh, uh, Speaker, I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk to some about uh, some of the investments uh, through the Southwest Ontario, West Ontario Economic Development Fund. Some of them very close to the member opposite's hometown. So let's talk about what's happening in Elmira, Speaker. Elmira Pet Products got a, a grant, created 25 jobs, retained another um, 146 jobs, Speaker, for a total of 171. Minamar in Guelph. Uh, received a, a grant, 51 new jobs Member created, from Duffer and Caledon, retained we'll come 374. To order. Uh, speaker in Palmerston, $250,000 to MSW Canadian Plastic Limited, created nine new jobs, retained 21 jobs. In Woodstock, NASG Canada, Speaker, uh, created 50 jobs, retained 210. Speaker, Answer. this investment is working, creating jobs. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, another non-answer. People are ready to hear new promises today, but they also remember this government's track record. Over the last 10 years, 300,000 good manufacturing jobs have disappeared. Our province has the highest electricity rates in the country, the lowest productivity growth, and an unemployment rate that is above the national average. The government says their old jobs plan is working, even while they try and roll out a new one. Are Ontarians ever going to hear a credible jobs plan from this government? I don't know why the member opposite is so darn negative. Because let me tell you, Speaker, we acknowledge the economy still faces a challenge. We know that, Speaker. But she might want to know that employment is up by 475,600 jobs since our low in June of 2009, Speaker. Numbers we are on the right track. We are creating jobs. We are retaining jobs. We believe in the people of this province, Speaker. We, <coughs> excuse me. We believe in the people of this province. We believe they are talented people, and we're going to continue to work with the people of this province because we believe that that's the strength of our future. Hey, hey. Thank you. Good question. 
A member from Renfrew, Mickelson, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. We've heard testimony at the Justice Committee from the Auditor and from senior officials in the Ontario Power Authority that your government was made aware of the costs of the Oakville Power Plant cancellation months before the Premier appeared before the Committee. Your claims to not have known simply aren't credible. Cabinet was made, was made aware, and the Premier was, was made aware. She knew that the costs were going to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but that's not what she told the public, and that's not what she told this House. Yesterday afternoon, we debated a motion that gave all members of this House an opportunity to hold her accountable for her actions, and the NDP sat on their hands. Absolutely. My question to the Acting Premier is simply this. Question. What secret deal have you made with the NDP to buy their silence? Sir. My uh, order, please. Order, please. This is uh, th this is skating on very thin ice when you uh, pose a question in a manner that impugns whether or not somebody is paying somebody. So I'm going to offer you an opportunity to resist any further reference of the such. Deputy Premier. Uh, government House Leader Speaker. Oh. You know, Mr. Speaker, the, the temptation is there uh, uh, with the, the, the ridiculous question that's just been asked. Yeah, I'm not going to fall for it because you know what, Mr. Speaker? This is serious, Mr. Speaker. It is very serious that the opposition over the past several months have stood up day after day after day, outlining the situation with the gas plants as being uh, uh, you know, one of the most serious issues before the province, and yet they fail to acknowledge the fact that in the last election, Mr. Speaker, they were the ones out front, their candidates, their leader, that was saying the only way to see the gas plants cancelled is to elect a PC government in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, it is time they came clean. The issues the member raised this morning have all been dealt with at committee. The Premier will go in front of committee, but the one issue that has not been raised is their commitment to cancel the plants, Answer. their costing, and their analysis, and it's time they came clean. This is a very serious issue, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. We know that the Liberals are willing to do anything to cling to power, yep. and yet the NDP are steadfast in their commitment to prop him up. Yep. If the Premier can be allowed to waste over a billion dollars without any consequences, what is to prevent even greater scandals from happening in the future? You've had nine months, and all you've done is attempt to get back that union support, and today's economic plan, your plan, your so-called jobs plan, proves that you're doing everything you can to get that union support back from the NDP. Union. Rumor has it that donations to the Liberals are up <coughs> and that the NDP are down. This government is responsible for scandal after scandal and will excuse itself for doing anything. The Premier has held no one accountable, and yesterday the NDP turned sure. their backs on Ontarians by refusing to hold the Premier accountable. When will you finally do the right thing and let the people of Ontario pass their judgment on this corrupt, tired, old government? Please. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Nope. House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we have tried with some success, Mr. Speaker, to make this government work. It is true, Mr. Speaker, we brought forward a budget. We reached out to both parties. The PC party refused to even read the budget. But yes, Mr. Speaker, we reached an agreement with the new Democratic Party. And in terms of the PC party, Mr. Speaker, quite recently we had a motion, a programming motion passed in this legislature, which allowed a number of very important pieces of legislation to move forward through committee and through to third reading. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to make this legislature work, Mr. Speaker, but I ask the honourable members opposite to continue to show willingness. Right now, Bill 105, which is going to cut taxes for small business, is stalled in committees because of the machinations of the opposition, Mr. Speaker. Let's continue that spirit of cooperation. Let's continue to make this legislature work. The member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the acting premier 
Speaker, the people of Windsor Nessus County have faced terrible uncertainty and anxiety when it comes to the access to cancer surgery as well as thoracic services in our home community. New Democrats have been asking for clarity and, assur and assurance from this government for a full week, but all we're hearing from the minister is spin. She's made it clear that she no longer wants Windsor to provide thoracic services, but the member from Windsor West has been evading the issue and implying that she supports thoracic services in Windsor. So can the acting premier come clean and tell us what the Liberal government's position is on Windsor's thoracic services today? Thank you. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Speaker. And uh, I can assure the people of Windsor that they will continue to have access to first-class cancer services, Speaker. And anything suggesting that they won't is simply fear-mongering, Speaker. They will receive those services in Windsor. The member from Windsor West and I actually met this morning with Michael Sherrar, the CEO of Cancer Care Ontario, uh, so that we could have a further conversation about this particular situation, Speaker. Um, I think it's uh, commendable that the member from Windsor West would take the time to understand the issue, to advocate for her community, and her commitment to quality of care is paramount, Speaker. So uh, uh, we know, Speaker, that uh, there is a relationship between volume of surgeries and quality of care. Cancer Care Ontario has driven quality yes, improvement in cancer care that has benefited all Ontarians, and we'll continue to work on this issue, Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, this government is all too happy to put out contradictory statements and to provide empty assur assurances, but the grim reality of the situation continues. Windsor and Essex County residents are faced with the loss of thoracic services under the threat of losing all cancer surgeries. Just yesterday, the CEO of Windsor Regional Hospital told the media that the threat from Cancer Care Ontario has yet to be withdrawn, and the hospital's concerns about the loss of thoracic services has not been addressed either. So will the acting premier let my constituents know if her government is done playing games and is ready to take action to protect Windsor's health care services? Deputy Premier. Absolutely, Speaker. Um, I am committed to excellent care for the people of Windsor and area, as I am for every other part of this province. And I think it's very important that the member opposite understands that the $6 million plus that is received by the Windsor hospitals from Cancer Care Ontario will continue, Speaker. That funding will continue because people in Windsor and area count on that funding to get the cancer care that they need. So, Speaker, we are uh, continuing, as I said, to work on the issue specific to one type of surgery, but cancer care services will absolutely continue in Windsor. And for the member opposite to suggest otherwise is simply irresponsible. Thank you. Your question, Member from Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. I know that Ontario's publicly funded education system is recognized as one of the best in the world, and I'm extremely proud of our accomplishments as our success is based on the talent dedication and hard work of those in our education community. Mr. Speaker, we have a lot to be proud of. Today, 71% of students are achieving the provincial standards in grade three and six combined, which is up 17 points from 54% in 2002-2003. And graduation rates are up 15 points from 2003 to 83% in 2013. While we have seen great progress over the last 10 years, I know we can't become complacent with this success. Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to hear that the minister recently visited Ottawa to talk about the next phase of, edu of education in our province. Can the minister please update this house on the consultations you have been Question. Great thank question. you, Minister Great of Education. Question. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa South for raising this initiative. You know, we do have a lot to be proud of when it comes to our accomplish accomplishments in education, and now is the time to build on that success and redefine our vision aspirations and our goals, not just for the system, but more importantly for our students. I was pleased to be able to travel to Ottawa recently to participate in our provincial consultation on how to take our education system from great to excellent. I've also had the pleasure of traveling to Thunder Bay, Sudbury, London, Richmond Hill, and Mississauga recently to hear directly from parents and our partners in education. We're asking questions about 
what skills do students new need to thrive in the 21st century? How do we support student well-being? And how can we Answer. make better use of technology in our schools? And a host more questions that will help direct our vision for education in the future. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you to the minister for bringing us up to speed on these next phase of consultations. I agree that it is important for us to continue to look forward on how we can make, take our system from great to excellent. We are already recognized globally as having one of the best publicly funded education systems in the English-speaking world. Mr. Speaker, we need to continue to work and strive for the best for our students. Mr. Speaker, through you, to the, can the minister describe to this House what she hopes to learn from these consultations and when we will finalize this next phase for education in Ontario? Here, here. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and it, uh, thank you again uh, for the question. It's important to note that this consultation has been a broader check-in than just with our uh, usual education stakeholders. We've been talking as well to business, to chambers of commerce, to nonprofit agencies and communities throughout the province, and to our students and to our parents. And we're talking about how to improve in areas like critical thinking, creativity, problem solving and communication skills, all skills you need for a variety of jobs in our province. We're talking about whether we should be teaching students more about entrepreneurship and financial literacy. What does that mean? What's the role of technology in our classrooms of the future? So, Speaker, this really is a broad range of That's topics right. with a whole host of people from every community. Uh, so we are looking forward to the release of a new vision early in 2015. Thank you. Question to the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Minister, yesterday in Estimates Committee, I asked your colleague, the Minister of Transportation, when we could expect to see the transit plan for the Pan Am Games. And I have to say his response was quite interesting. Your colleague said that we might get the plan in the next few weeks, but they won't really have a clear picture of the cost until the games are finished. What? That begs the question, why even have a budget? Yeah. If your strategy for the Pan Am Games is just to endlessly bill the taxpayers, why even make the budget? The sad thing is, given the Minister of Transportation's comments in your, re in your record, Whatever numbers come out of the Pan Am Games transit plan will have no credibility. None. Minister, do you agree with the Minister of Transportation? Do you also have no clue what the Pan Am Game transit plans are going to cost? Thank you, thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much for the question. Speaker, as you know, the Pan Am game is a, a, a huge undertaking by the province. Come 2015, uh, there will be 41 uh, countries. The competitor come to Toronto, and the game will attract about, according to CIBC, 350,000 tourists coming to our town. Uh, Speaker, the Minister of Transportation and TO 2015 are leading the development of an integrated transportation plan for the games. Transportation planning for an event of this scale is complex, takes time, and involves many organizations. Right. including the promise, municipality, transit systems, and security planning. Speaker, we are working very Answer. closely with the OPP and municipal police to ensure that transportation will be safe and secure. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. A member from Barry. We haven't got a clue. Matt. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question is to the minister responsible for Pan Am Games as well. Minister, you can't keep using complexity as an excuse for not having a budget. It's precisely why you need a budget. Uh, even your own colleague yesterday seemed to throw you under the bus for the Pan Am transportation busing estimates yesterday. Apparently, you won't have transportation costs figured out until after the games. Very perplexing. Let me remind you, the value of having a real budget ahead of time is to ensure that people who are paying for the games are being respected and that you're being accountable. Why do we even have ministers? But there lies the second problem, Minister. None of your Pan Am budgeting to date is credible. What do they do? Anytime you need more money, you just buried it in another ministry and your game of misdirection is over. I want to know how much is buried in transportation in any other ministry. Minister, the Pan Am Transportation Plan be another hidden extra above and beyond the $1.4 billion deployed Pan question. Am budget? Thank you. Minister. thank you, thank you, Speaker. A transportation master plan that will guide our operations as we prepare for the Games 
and is on track. Past game speaker have revealed their transportation plans 12 to 18 months before they are underway, and we plan to match that timeline speaker. We're also working together on an integrated stakeholder outreach and engagement plan, which will be used to guide transportation-related communications to all stakeholders. Speaker, That's transportation too. costs have not been fully defined. The Games are the first time the province has undertaken a transportation plan exercise of this magnitude. Speaker, costs will be identified as a transportation planning process is completed Answer. and the full scope of the transportation needs is better understood. Thank you, Speaker. Give a new question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, nuclear officials are preparing to transport a toxic stew of liquid bomb-grade uranium by armed convoy from Chalk River, Ontario to a South Carolina reprocessing site. This so-called high-priority mission marks the first time that authorities have attempted to truck highly enriched uranium in a liquid solution. This announcement has alarmed nuclear safety groups on both sides of the border, and they're sounding the alarm for far greater government scrutiny. What safeguards has this government put in place to protect Ontario residents from this potential dangerous practice? Deputy Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. I know that uh, nuclear safety is the responsibility of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Yep. Uh, it is 100% responsible. It provides the oversight. Uh, accepts the responsibility for it, Mr. Speaker. We work very closely with that agency when we're asked to, um, and uh, the member should know that. Um, and uh, he's raising concerns. Uh, I will pass those concerns on to uh, my federal counterpart. Uh, and I'm sure, like in every other case, when the NDP has raised concerns about the transportation of nuclear products, that they have been properly dealt with and no incidents have occurred from them. The record is impeccable, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the acting premier. Speaker, this government has to understand there are grave public safety issues at stake here, and the trucking of nuclear waste through our communities requires proper government oversight. In August, a truck with radioactive cargo on the busy I-75 highway near Troy, Ohio, caught fire. But despite the fiery emergency, nuclear regulators in Canada, where the cargo originated and in the U.S., were not informed of the incident. Will this government provide hard evidence that the transport of liquid uranium poses no danger to the public and ensure that local officials are given advance notification of the transport of nuclear waste through their region? Speaker, nuclear Minister. safety is a top priority for Ontario, and it has been for the 40 or 50 years that we've been in the business. Nuclear power has been safely prov providing electricity in the province for 40 years. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission and Transport Canada are responsible for issuing transport license applications related to nuclear materials in accordance with stringent regulations for compliance in connection with public safety and emergency preparedness. As the federal regulator, the CNSC would not allow the transportation of any equipment material if there were a risk to the public or the environment. The type of incident he's referring to in the United States has not occurred in Ontario, and it won't, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my uh, question is for um, Maria Sergio, who is uh, the minister in charge of seniors' affairs. Unfortunately, in the society that we live in, this more and more often involves elder abuse, mental, physical, even financial. The WHO defines abuse of older adults as a single or repeated act or lack of appropriate action occurring in any relationship where there's an expectation of trust that causes harm or distress to an older person. The reality is this, Speaker. Seniors are often the victim of fraud. They tend to be trusting and generous individuals, which of course can make them prey to fraudsters. Speaker, given the Minister's role at the Ontario Senior Secretariat, I would like to know personally, and I'd like Ontarians to know, what actions is our government taking to protect our seniors? Thank you very much, Monsieur le Président. Je suis très heureux. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very honoured to be able to 
answer the question by my colleague, the member for Etobicoke North. Uh, our seniors, are ne they are not only trusting, generous, but uh, very giving as well. Uh, speaker, I have to say that thanks to their contribution that they have made our country, our province, our community, they are much better off today. Speaker, uh, shielding and safeguarding, protecting our seniors, it's my responsibility, that of the government and every member of the House. We introduced legislation seeking to combat elder abuse, uh, to raise education and to educate as well. We injected more than $8 million in 2003, Speaker, including the Bill of Rights for Seniors and Zero Tolerance as well. More than that, Speaker, let me say that in the next few days, we have an extra reason to remember our seniors, uh, those brave men yes, and sir. women that on November 11th, they fought uh, in the First Second World War and the Korean War so we can enjoy our freedom today. When it comes to our senior speaker, we can Thank never you. do enough. We will continue to do everything Thank we can you. for the safety and protection of our Supplementary. Mille grazie, Senor Sergio. <laughs> speaker, I appreciate the response, diligence, and heartfelt commitment of uh, the minister in this portfolio. As a physician and parliamentarian, I am seeing more and more elder abuse in my various capacities. I believe that from my riding of Etobicoke North, there is, however, a certain degree of reassurance to know that the province understands the importance of combating elder abuse and that the machinery of government is mobilized in this regard. Seniors, their contribution, their hard work, their collective wisdom are all precious resources. Even so, Speaker, sadly, many seniors are taken advantage of financially, even by their own mem family members. Speaker, how is Ontario working with other Canadian jurisdictions to alert seniors about financial fraud, whether it come from friend or foe? Minister. Uh, speaker, uh, thank you very much to the member from Etobicoke North. Uh, Molte grazie. Merci beaucoup. Uh, muchas thank you very much. Uh, and it's very, I have to say that the member from Etobicoke North is a real champion, and it's a remarkable member when it comes to our senior speaker. And I have to say that the question couldn't come at a better time when we are celebrating National Seniors Week throughout Canada. And the theme, in fact, is fight fraud and protect uh, our seniors' uh, finances. Uh, speaker, I have to say that I had the pleasure a couple of weeks ago of participating with members from all the uh, uh, federal, provincial and territorial uh, ministries uh, with respect to uh, raising the issue of seniors. And I am very proud as an Ontarian and Minister for the Province of Ontario to bring forth to the table and get approved a uh, uh, brochure with respect to power of attorney and uh, joint bank accounts. Uh, speaker, I have to say that when it comes to our seniors in our province, in Ontario here, there are no boundaries. And I hope Thank that you. this goes for every member of the House. Thank you. The member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, tomorrow will be the 10th day since you promised to respond to Kim Fletcher about the crisis that she and her family face. That means that's another 10 per cent of her medically predicted life expectancy has gone by while you have continued to do nothing. Minister, yours is a sacred trust, one that you choose to ignore when it comes to highly vulnerable individuals like Kim, who look to you as their last resort and their court of final appeal. So today I'm taking the matter directly to the people of Ontario and I'm issuing a province-wide petition on Kim's behalf. The question is, Minister, will you at least now act on that sacred trust and, and respond to the voice and the will of the people of Ontario? Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, I can assure the member opposite and everyone else in this province that I take my responsibility as Minister of Health extremely seriously. I know, I know, Speaker, that people are counting on me to do my job well so they can get the health care they need when they need it, Speaker. I, I, the member opposite continues to heckle. I, I, I find that Very disgusting, serious. frankly. Speaker, Order. I think it's important that the member opposite Order. understands that when it comes to funding cancer drugs, we have tripled funding for cancer-fighting drugs. For every one dollar they spent, we are spending three, Speaker. We are blessed in this province to have excellent cancer care. We have amongst the highest survival rates Answer. in the world, Speaker. We have those results because we rely on science to make our decisions. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. That increased uh, spending isn't helping Kim, is it? Nope. Minister, the petition I'm releasing today concludes the Ontario Parliament call, call on the Premier and the Minister of Health to extend OHIP funding of the drug Avastin so that Kim Fletcher and others like her can have as much time to enjoy with her family as possible and to tell the Wind Administration that our health care system includes Kim Fletcher. Again, I ask you, Minister, why doesn't your health care system include Kim Fletcher? Uh, speaker, in my health care system, people get access to the drugs they need based on their condition, not based on an MPP that they might know, Speaker. We apply the same rules to everyone, Speaker. To single out one individual for exceptional access is not consistent with my commitment to provide excellent care to all Ontarians. We rely on science, Speaker. We rely on evidence. The members opposite have chosen to disregard evidence, to disregard science. I think that is wrong, Speaker. I believe, because I do feel I am put in a position of enormous responsibility, that I must rely on evidence so that we can get people the care they need, the care that will help them. Speaker, seniors in the London area are facing unacceptable wait times for cataract surgery. My constituents are writing me as surely as they are writing the Minister of Health in distress. Who to, please? Because of the year long wait times for this. Who, please? Oh, my apologies. The Minister of Health. Excuse me. She's been getting a lot of questions, so I just <laughs> forgot to introduce her. <laughs> Do you want me to start again, Speaker? No? Okay. So I'm going to start with the. My constituents have been writing me, Minister, surely as they've been writing you in distress because of the year-long wait times of this necessary surgery. Speaker, ophthalmologists warned this government that problems were brewing, and the Liberal government chose to ignore their concerns. Question. Now seniors are waiting, are paying the price. Does the health minister think it is right that seniors need cataract sur needing cataract surgery are forced to wait for a year or longer in her own Thank hometown you. riding? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, Speaker, I welcome this question because uh, this this party has a very strong record when it comes to focusing on getting wait times down. In fact, Speaker, we have recently, for the sixth year in a row, received straight A's from the Wait Time Alliance, Speaker. Our wait times are lower than anywhere else. We've made great progress, Speaker. Province-wide, we've cut five months off wait times for cataract surgeries. In the Southwest, Lynn, Speaker, when we took office, people were waiting 351 days. They were waiting a full year for that surgery. We have cut that wait time in half, Speaker. Across the province, we have reduced wait times for cataracts. We've reduced wait times for, uh, for various Answer. surgeries and, and uh, diagnostic tests. We're very transparent about it. You can go online and see what wait times are for any procedures um, in any hospital in this Thank province. You. Supplementary. Speaker, living with reduced eyesight can impact every aspect of someone's life. One constituent wrote about this year-long wait time. And I quote, this is unacceptable. My quality of life as a senior is grossly affected. I have problems with glare and this may affect my driving. This not only affects me, but also affects my immediate family as I am, I am not able to pick up my, grandchild, my grandchildren after school, which will cost my daughter after school care. The Minister of Health seems more concerned with patting herself on the back than taking the concerns of our constituents seriously. Speaker, my question is simple. Can the minister tell my constituents when cataract wait times will be reduced? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, for all of the reasons that uh, were mentioned in that letter, that is why we have really focused on bringing wait times down for cataract, Speaker. So across the province, wait times are down significantly, Speaker. We were the first ones to actually measure publicly post, publicly report, and, and invest money to bring those wait times down. We have seen 
tremendous success, Speaker. In fact, I bet the member opposite would be interested in knowing our wait time success in other procedures. 98% of cancer surgeries are being done within the, uh, the priority level four target, Speaker. 100% of bypass surgeries, 94% of cataract surgeries, 89% of hip replacements, 85% of knee replacements, 61% of MRIs, 87% of CT, 98% of general surgeries, 92% of pediatric surgeries. Speaker, wait times are a Thank big you. focus of our ministry, and we're seeing the results. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, in my riding of Ottawa Orleans, I often meet and listen, with, uh, listen to families, as do all members of this House. One concern that I hear frequently from parents is that they want to know that the right services are in place for their child's development. This is a, is a universal concern, and I know that in Ontario we're providing some of the best supports available anywhere in the world. As a parent and grandparent myself, I know that these types of services make positive impacts in the lives of children. My question is, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House what we are doing as a government to help children grow up to be healthy teenagers and then healthy adults? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa Orleans about this question. And first off, the number of children here, welcome. Welcome to all the children visiting us here today. And it's uh, for you that this, this question is very important. I'm a parent as well, as everyone knows, and nothing's imp more important to me and I think everyone in this house to make sure that children are prepared for school and life. And let me say, I can say that there are much many more programs available today than there were when my kids were young. My ministry is investing $261 million in healthy development services and supports directly for children and their parents. For example, we're providing Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program with $89 million. This program supports women, children and their families from prenatal period through to a child's transition to school. Through programs like this, our government is able to directly assist yes, in the healthy development of our young people. This is part of our government's commitment to provide children with the best possible start in life. Thank you. Supplementary. thank you, Speaker, and I would like to thank the Minister for her answer. It is very clear to me that this government takes the responsibility of healthy childhood development seriously and is making significant investments. However, this is an area where there is always improvement to be made. As a government, we need to be constantly looking to improve the services we provide and also seek out new and better methods. I understand that in March of this year, a Healthy Kids panel released a report with recommendations to improve health childhood development, specifically reduce childhood obesity. I am pleased that our government established this panel to help combat such an important issue. Can the minister please tell this house more about this report and how our government is responding? Thank you, minister. Much. And again, thank you for the follow-up question. And firstly, I'd like to thank the Healthy Kids panel for their report that aims to improve the health and well-being. The report made a number of recommendations on some important Ministry of Children and Youth Services programs, as well as recommendations across government as well. These include our poverty reduction strategy, student nutrition program, and the mental health and addiction strategy, all strategies that we are investing in. We're committed to reviewing the recommendations in order to inform our future. And in fact, Speaker, Minister Matthews and I are co-chairing a working group on the Healthy Kids Panel Report to review each of those recommendations. That group will be extremely important to move toward this government's goal to improve early childhood yes, development services. Again, we're committed to working with our colleagues across ministries to inform next steps. Thank you. New question. The member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Um, my question is to the Minister of Energy. Uh, Minister, I'm sending these energy bills to you. I'd like to appreciate you taking a look at them, and I'll leave them with Paige Sehran. Thank you. <clears throat> Minister, earlier this week, I met with a business owner from my riding who showed me his massive energy bills. Most notably, his global adjustment has skyrocketed. And if you look at his bills, you'll notice that he's using less power than two years ago but paying much more, and his global adjustment has almost tripled. Another business owner told me that he, quote, is considering leaving Ontario and moving to the Detroit area where he can get cheaper rent and his energy costs would be half of what they currently are, end quote, taking jobs and tax revenue from my community. 
Minister, my question is simply this. If you were in my shoes, what would you tell these business owners? Minister of Energy. First of all, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would tell those owners that uh, we have made significant investments in the energy system because of the negligence of that party when they were in government, requiring us to spend uh, $21 billion in new generation, Mr. Speaker, $10 billion in new transmission, uh, and that pushed electricity rates up. As a result of those rates going up, Mr. Speaker, investments which were absolutely necessary to create a reliable and clean system, we created a number of programs for uh, the energy sector, uh, including the clean energy benefit for families, uh, for industry, and that includes small business and farmers, Mr. Speaker, the energy uh, and property tax credit, uh, Northern Ontario energy credit, Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, Industrial Conservation Initiative, Answer. Industrial Electricity Incentive. In addition to that, over the last seven or eight months, Mr. Speaker, we've taken major steps to push, put pressure to push prices Thank down, you. Mr. Speaker, and that included Thank you. about. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, well, Minister, actions do speak louder than words, and I really hope that you're not misleading Ontarians. Withdraw. I withdraw. Minister, my riding of Chatham, Kent, Essex, has lost over 10,000 manufacturing jobs since this government took place in 2003, and we cannot afford to lose any more. You tell turbine companies not to produce energy while you continue to pay them for not producing energy. All the while, more and more turbines continue to be built up, not only in my riding, but throughout Ontario. Here's the reality, Minister. Energy costs are doubling and crippling manufacturing. Businesses and families are struggling to pay bills Question. and keep their lights on. Admit that your Green Energy Act is a failure. Ministry, will you admit that you do not have a real Thank plan you. to lower energy rates? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Planted, and as I said earlier today in question period, by renegotiating the Samsung agreement, we saved ratepayers $3.7 billion over the life of the contract. Changing the domestic content rules for the feed in tariff program, we saved ratepayers more than $1.9 billion over the life of the contracts. Deferring the construction of two nuclear reactors at Darlington Generating Station, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, is avoiding an estimated $15 billion in new construction. All of those would have put pressure on costs going up. Mr. Speaker, these are going to put the right uh, uh, pressure on, on, uh, on our investments to push costs down, Mr. Speaker, and we will be releasing our long-term energy plan within several weeks, uh, and uh, I ask the uh, yes, member to await that, and he'll see exactly what the future holds for us. Thank you. New question. We're from Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Grassy Narrows First Nation was not consulted in good faith when the long-term management direction of the Whiskey Jack Forest on their traditional land was developed. MNR plans show that clear-cutting on traditional Grassy Narrows territory will start as early as 2014, despite the community's strong objections. In 2012, Premier Wynne visited Grassy Narrows as Minister of Aboriginal Affairs and talked about rebuilding Grassy Narrows' relationship with Ontario to get it right. Yet the exact opposite is happening. Will the minister uphold his duty, do the right thing, and consult with Grassy Narrows to obtain their consent regarding any forestry plans on their traditional lands? Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Speaker, and I certainly appreciate the question from the member. We obviously are very concerned about the participation of First Nations in the forestry uh, industry and their activity. Uh, the member knows full well that there is a uh, court challenge that is going to the Supreme Court as a result of the province uh, being successful in, a, in a, a case that took place earlier with respect to the province having the right to be able to uh, issue harvesting licenses in the area. 
We are certainly committed to working with the uh, Grassy Narrows First Nation. We value their involvement and their uh, participation in forest harvesting. Uh, as the member knows as well, wood from the Whiskey Jack continues to provide economic opportunities for First Nation communities as well as the local mills and also uh, including a mill that is owned and operated by a local First Nation uh, member. Under the contingency yes, plan, there is no planned harvest blocks located within the Grassy and Arrows self-identified uh, traditional lands, but we are very mindful of this issue and are committed to working Thank with you. the Grassy and Arrows First Nation. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. This Liberal government's disregard for the consultation process is causing serious problems with economic development in addition to endangering this province's relationship with First Nations. Grassy Narrows believes that MNR officers are interfering with their community members as they go about performing their regular traditional activities on their traditional land instead of engaging in real consultation. Will this government commit today to coming to the table, engaging with Grassy Narrows in serious consultation, and obtaining their consent when it comes to activities within their traditional territory? Minister. Speaker, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. Our government is committed to participating and working with actively the First Nations uh, in this area uh, with respect to the Whiskey Jack Forest as well as uh, the Grassy Narrows First Nation. The member also knows that uh, wood that comes off the Whiskey Jack SFL uh, goes to support a mill that is owned and operated by a local First Nation member and that the 10-year uh, Crown Forest Sustainability uh, Act as well as the uh, the, the uh, forest license management plan that is actively being undertaken is inclusive of First Nations interests and rights, and we are very concerned and uh, are very actively working with the First Nations to ensure their participation in this area that is so vital to their uh, livelihood. So, uh, Speaker, you know, I'd say to the member opposite, Answer. we're going to continue to do that. We have a strong relationship in working with our First Nations, a strong uh, partnership uh, with First Nations, and uh, I'm certainly very pleased with the Thank progress you. that we've made. Thank you. A new question, the member from Scarborough News River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Legal Aid Ontario plays a vital role in providing access to justice throughout the province by providing high-quality legal aid services in a cost-effective and efficient manner. Speaker, too many constituents who are in need of legal advice find it can be very costly, and that may deter them from seeking appropriate legal advice. In most recent budget, our government made a commitment to expand funding to Legal Aid Ontario. Speaker, can the Attorney General please share how this new funding will expand services and how it may expand access to justice for low-income Ontarians and some of the more vulnerable citizens? Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you very much for the question. It's unfortunate there won't be enough time for a supplementary speaker because this is a good news story. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that our government this year has committed an extra $30 million in extra funding over the next three years for Legal Aid Ontario with a specific emphasis on family law services and legal aid clinics. Now, that's in addition to $150 million that was uh, given over four years back in 2009, Speaker. The unfortunate part is that whereas at one time legal aid was the joint responsibility of the federal and provincial government, and the funding was on a 50-50 basis. Wow. Currently, we're only getting 20 percent of the total funding from the federal government. Next week, there will be meetings with other provincial and territorial ministers, as well as the Minister of Justice, and this is certainly one issue that we'll be addressing uh, uh, with him at that point of time. Because Answer. access to justice, whether it's in the criminal courts, the civil courts, or family court, is absolutely essential if we want to have a good system Thank of you. justice in the province Thank of Ontario. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London, has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the minister responsible for the 2015 Pan Para Pan American Games concerning the Games Transit Plan. This matter will be debated Tuesday, November the 19th at 6 p.m. My dear friends, this is the last day for our pages, and we wish them well. I do believe they've done a tremendous job, and they do us, they do us proud, and they do their families proud as well. Yeah.
There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.